how about how about we discuss uh, sunyata, uh, the, turn, the traditional translation of parts of the Heart Sutra, for example, and what it means to what we view as non-duality, what our experience is of non non awakening and what uh, is often translated as the void from the Buddhist texts. Right. Uh, well, what's interesting is, is that uh, on the one hand, it can be helpful because if I translate sunyata as zero, for example, mm -hmm. I can think, well, I'm practicing in order to achieve a kind of zero state mm -hmm. of my self-referential thought. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that what is achieved then, experienced then, by whom, is a zero state. To the contrary, um, the way I used to put it to myself uh you know, rather early on in my practice when I was really getting some, uh, starting to get results was you have to make, go to zero to find the one. Mm -hmm. You have to make zero uh, in order to see how to experience unity. And so I think the translation of void or emptiness is really unfortunate because it makes people feel like what they're looking for is, uh, what is nothingness and they're seeking some sort of nothingness when the experience is fullness itself, because mm -hmm. you're getting out of the way of the cosmos itself in some ways. Right. Well, the whole thing about form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Um, that I've seen very little in the Buddhist scriptures, I'm not an expert on them, of course, but that really do anything but disabuse, that disabuse people with the fact that this is an empty, dark void of the worst possible existential kind you can imagine. And I think that scares people away from a lot of the practices because they think they're going to get to zero. And I don't know if this was this gets into guessing what the Buddha why the Buddha did it the way he did it. I mean he seemingly took that discussion off the table, just pedagogically to be able to let's just look at what we can validate. Yeah. Don't don't speculate about what's there. Just look. Just look. Just look yeah. directly. And and so he didn't postulate a you know a different explanation for that state that would be would be sweeter. But in my experience, you can jump in on this too. It's a very sweet space. I mean, it it, it may be when you first land into it, uh, it's still a little bit uncertain. Uh, it is not quite so sweet, but it's not bad. Uh, and I did not see any dark night of the soul. There's a lot of dark night of the soul stuff going around right now. I didn't see one. Many people haven't seen one. It's not required. It tends to be, in my experience, very heavily correlated to your Christian upbringing and how deeply you were imbued with the belief that there was a dark night of the soul. But it comes in as a kind of a medium place. But with my experience, it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter with time very soon. And it looks like it's dopaminergically reinforced to be sweet. Right. Well, the, the, tradi the Tibetan tradition, they have the translation Rigpa of uh, clear awareness mm -hmm. uh, and or, or, you know, Buddha nature is another way of uh, thinking about it. And I think the problem with this language of emptiness and void is, as you pointed out, it makes it, it makes it less likely that people are actually going to look mm -hmm. and get still enough to be with it because it feels like they're going to have to face the abyss. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yes, from an egoic perspective, it's what the ego thinks is an abyss because the ego wants to take credit mm -hmm. for everything that's coming into existence. So all that's coming out of nothing. There's nothing there. If it weren't for me, then you're just going to, you're going to, you're going to see that abyss. But if you can tarry with that quote unquote abyss, mm -hmm. you can see that it's anything but. So for example, one of the people I found useful, uh, in, in for my own framework, Franklin Merrill Wolf, the early 20th century mathematician who then was interested in, what is the nature of consciousness such that mathematics can come out of it is, oh, right. and is possible. Right. Uh, he describes very clearly in one, what he called his, one of his realizations. He said that he abstracted the subjective moment from the objective manifold of consciousness. So he looked at the little bit that he was, mm -hmm. and he says, of course, at first it appeared as darkness mm -hmm. because our senses are used to looking out into the world, so-called the, the objective manifold. So then when we look in, we don't see that. Mm -hmm. And in not seeing that at first, 
it seems like it's darkness. And he said, but then he says, I very quickly saw that it was light Mm -hmm. and fullness. And it's only the initial kind of glance Mm -hmm. that because it's different from the outside nature of reality, it's not that. But in it's not being not that, it is anything but the negation of that. And if one can have even the tiniest bit of patience to look at that so-called abyss, you see that it is the source of all things. Right. And the more you're able to experience that it is the source of all things, the more you do experience that it's the source of all things, and your ego can take less and less credit for what's going on in the world. It, to me, the, the, the experiences I've ever had of, of nervousness or anxiety or paranoia or darkness, as you were putting it, were really the kind of response from my egoic self that didn't like where this was going. Oh, yeah. And ego, this is not on ego's Christmas list. No. I mean, the last thing the ego wants to have happen is to be out of a job. But even the ego is misinformed about the nature of this space because, as you know, I've given my ego quite an important job. It's the <laughs> executive vice president of neurodynamic inventory and control. That's right. And anytime self-referential thoughts occur has the very important job of taking those referential thoughts, seeking their source, and returning them there. Exactly. See? Yeah. It's a very important job. Yeah. Without that job, I couldn't stay in the source. But, but even the great fear around not having thoughts. And I, and I was type A guilty of that. I mean, I, I think I, mean, I mentioned to you, I believed, because I was a knowledge worker, that if my thoughts stopped, I would literally, literally die. I would just die. I was so convinced of that. And so that's, that's how we're trained to believe that thoughts are really necessary. And you find out that it isn't even close to being true. And we do, in the course of a night, we dream of sleep, we don't have thoughts. Wake up in the morning, there's a space you don't have thoughts. In between thoughts, you don't have thoughts. Thoughts are not, eh, there's a break between thoughts. And yet, you know, you're so conditioned to believe that you have to have these things. And people say, oh, if I lose my thoughts like I did, you will die. Something awful will happen. But you go, you lie in the gutter. There's no hope for you. In fact, that's absolutely not true. Well, especially for people who are making their living with ideas, hmm. which, as distinct from thoughts, do not uh, uh, stop. Mm-hmm. They, in fact, become more available. Right. But, uh, again, it's this idea. It's like, well, that's all well and good, but I make my living off of thoughts, or I am my thoughts is what's uh, well, that's the really... True. Yeah. So ultimately, that is true. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the I is... The I is, itself is, is thoughts, thoughts, but that's not the whole person no. uh, who's experiencing them. So, um, to me, it's akin to the language of ego death that was used a lot in the 60s and 70s in the psychological literature, to describe, you know, psychedelic experience and other um, manifestations of the reality of source, mm-hmm. is that it's rhetorically unfortunate because it sends the message that there's something very negative going on when beyond the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the uh, sweetest, uh, fullest, most... Uh, kind of loving and caring and manifesting experience that anyone could ever wish for. It's what one is looking for in drugs or in sex or material accomplishment or uh, even love of another human being is actually what is right in us, which if we will learn how to focus our awareness on it, will begin to manifest more and more. Well, and we confuse the processes by which we get into this space uh, by causing the space. And in fact, all they are is allowing you to get out of the way, mm-hmm. whether it's any things you mentioned or anything else. You know, to get you that space, we do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, and yet, the space is what you're after. Mm-hmm. The thing itself to get there is just it's not that important. And you can get there much more simply. Right. Well, the, and the reason I'm convinced why it appears difficult to arrive at the space is because what our enculturation consists of is everything but that space. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about there's a moment that um, people could meditate on or experience that if you're traveling, say, 
and you're uh, lucky enough to have a hotel room to stay in. And you open the door to the hotel room and you go in yeah. and there's an almost automatic involuntary turning on of the television in order to crowd out mm -hmm. that space mm -hmm. because there is a space, there's a moment of pure silence that we've, we've learned how to fear mm -hmm. because for whatever reason, our culture has bootstrapped itself off of the negation of that, mm -hmm. right? Not that, not that, not mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really feeling when we feel that fear of that, or when we call that the void, that is our enculturation process speaking, yeah. right? And if we can just stay with it and when we open the door, feel the silence that is there and not immediately exactly. go and turn on the television or immediately attempt to fill that silence with something that it begins to grow. Yeah. Once singular came out they were way back when that was on their ads. I mean, silence is weird. <laughs> But good weird. But good weird. But good weird. <laughs> but people are so afraid. I think that's part of the fear of of people just categorically not looking at no thoughts is they're just afraid of that space. They just don't have any sense it would be anything desirable, pleasurable, interesting, whatever. And it turns out exactly to be false, completely false. <laughs> ¶¶